Good afternoon. Welcome to the first White House Mapathon. Yeah. Thank you for being here to both our folks in the room and our audience on the live stream. We're streaming right now at whitehouse.gov live, and the video will be available on that site later today. Today we come together to highlight and do some really exciting work in open mapping or crowdsourced mapping where anyone can contribute to maps of the world. We have a great group of you here in the room to participate with us from government agencies, including the State Department, the Department of Interior, the Peace Corps, to colleagues in academia and industry and aid groups. We even have some students in the room, yeah? Um, welcome. We're also very excited to have some remote mappers participating in mapping parties um, here in Washington, DC, and actually around the globe in Botswana. Um, Open mapping is a growing area of our work in open government, which has been a big priority for this administration. It's a way to not only show what the government is up to, but to engage the public in important work so we can provide better services and be more effective together. I'd like to give a special thanks to the team behind this event, led by Presidential Innovation Fellow Mikkel Marin, who is a... Mikkel works for the State Department. He is a geographer and a mapper, and he will take the stage shortly to tell us more about what we'll do here together today. But first, we'll hear from Megan Smith, the U.S. Chief Technology Officer, to welcome us. Megan. Thanks. It's so awesome to be here. Um, so uh, one of the things I just want to reflect upon is mapping has been fundamental and important to us from the beginning of our country. And who more uh, than uh, President Washington to reflect on, right? So our surveyor, first president. Um, I just want to invoke him and his vision and, and sort of the, he had so much amazing mapping work that he did himself. Um, I also sometimes reference that he started the Army Corps of Engineers before the country was founded. Um, you know, and, and actually they wear that little bunker, you know, the, the bunker fort. You know, you see them and it's, it's the first thing they built. But the, the importance of technology specifically, and then the real importance, you know, with you guys today of mapping and what it means, it, it allows people to sort of have context and the layers that come on top of the maps are so extraordinary. And I, I was lucky in industry to work on some of the acquisitions of some of the strong um, mapping teams that are out there. It's exciting to see so many different map platforms come together and all of them really that using that open form. You know, I love the videos on YouTube when you can go and see, you know, you, you know a place has a million or two million people, but you zoom there in a map and there's like a line or two and you know there's more there and shortly thereafter, you know, the mappers get going. And uh, all of a sudden, the world emerges there. And the diaspora and the local people put themselves on the map. And to have those tools there, I think the most poignant one recently was in Nepal. Um, Dr. Nama leading together with many people in this room. I, I just heard from Mikhail the stats, which are in 48 hours, 2,000 mappers convened digitally and, and in locations like this, kind of a, a mapping uh, giving thing from their home to group sessions to match uh, 20,000 kilometers, is that right? Yeah, and uh, 150,000 build, 150, buildings. Yeah, just so amazing. Just to provide that information set, because we know that it's pretty hard to get an ambulance to a place if you can't get the directions. It's pretty hard to do commerce if you can't figure out where to go. Um, it's pretty hard to build and do urban planning if you don't have these resources. So sort of every, all the fabric of our economy and our culture and our society really depends on mapping in many ways, and it's been true so, so much. And also our point of view from the very beginning, explorers and people all around the world as they went out to today, what we can see. And I'll note that there's a cabinet meeting uh, later today, and in the slides there are several slides with maps on them because mapping is so key. So I just, uh, it's an honor to be here with you guys. Um, I thank Corey and Mikkel and the teams that have pulled this together. I would note that GOTUS is in the house. <laughs> Do you guys know what GOTUS is? You know what POTUS is, right? At POTUS? What's GOTUS? 
Yes, the geographer of the United States of America. So I, he's here, and you're going to hear from him later. Um, so I, I guess I'll end with that other than I just quickly sort of want to note who's here with you guys. So just some shout outs. Who's all in the room? Agencies, nonprofits, other State people. Department. State Department. Who else? Foundation. What? Police Foundation. Police Foundation. Department of Energy. Department of Energy. Noah. What? NOAA. Oh, NOAA. Oh, NOAA, on which we sit, G GIS and NOAA, we sit on so much government data. The President's opened 130,000 data sets with all the help of many people in this room since we've been here. The more we can open, the better. Who's? Peace Corps. Peace Corps. EGA. EGA. USAID. USAID. USGS. 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 Thank you, USGS. Yeah. NREL. NREL. DCPS. DCPS. Yeah. And who's the youngest person in the room? This guy. Stand yeah. up. <laughs> <laughs> you have to represent somehow all youth. So thanks for being here. <laughs> Here's another one. Where, where are you guys from? School Without Walls. What? School Without Walls. Are you guys both school without walls? Yeah, I cool. High school? Middle. middle school in the house. The power that is middle school and high school. Thanks, guys, for being here. Other, other shout outs? GIS Consumer school. Finance. Consumer Finance. GIS Core. GIS Core. Interior. What? Interior. interior. And Interior just hosted the coolest hackathon on REC. And I see there's signs for every kid in a park. It's the centennial coming up of the national parks. And we hope. Um, we hope that we can get every kid in a park with a special focus on fourth graders. And so there was a, they were part of the hackathon. But just how do we uh, make camping easier, visiting easier, collaborating easier? And so some of the apps that came out of that were really brilliant. So good stuff. Who else? A couple more names. Heal River Indian Community. What? Heal River Indian Community. Heal and River Indian Community. Native American Community. Indian Community. Mm -hmm. Terrific. Thank you. National State Geographic Information Council. National State Geographic Information Council. Okay, one more? All right, I'm going to leave it at that. Thank you for being here, and thank you for your collaboration, and thank you to everyone online for your collaboration, too. Thanks, Megan. Next up, we have Jason Goldman, who is joining us to talk about mapping. He's the United States Chief Digital Officer. All right. All right. Thank you for having me. Let's do all the shout outs again. No, it's okay. Uh, thanks very much. I'm really excited to be here. Thank you so much for everyone coming, especially thanks to everyone tuning on online. Um, my office is the Office of Digital Strategy. Uh, the Office of Digital Strategy exists here in the White House, and the mission of my office is connecting people with purpose. Uh, and what we mean by connecting people with purpose is connection. It's not just about disseminating talking points or disseminating policy. It's actually forging a connection with the American people. People is the second part of our mission, which means going direct where people engage, finding the audiences that exist online. And the final point is purpose, which I think of as creating the emotional doorway that gets people to a place where they're ready to act. And mapping is one of the great ways in which engagement happens online, because mapping provides the context uh, for all of these great engagements uh, on how people can get active in their neighborhood, how people can get active in their world. But it also helps them understand what they're doing uh, fits into a larger cohesive whole. So this picture uh, is from uh, a friend of mine and a software engineer named uh, Nelson, uh, Nelson Minar. He's an engineer who uh, lives in San Francisco, California. And he built this uh, map of flow lines in the continental US uh, based on the uh, NHD plus uh, data set. Uh, and the cool thing about this is it immediately shows this organic view of the United States that helps you understand how all of, all of America's waterways are connected in some ways. It shows what America looks like in some ways on this very, you know, Venus level, like of what it looks like, you know, when you peel back the skin and see uh, sort of the flows of America's waterways. But there's a couple other interesting things about this. First of all, it's built on open data, so that's great. The second is that he checked all this project into GitHub so that other people can build on, on it as well. And his work itself was inspired by Ben Fry's work on the All Streets map. So this kind of shows how maps exist in a dialogue online, and they create a conversation in and of themselves before you even start layering on any social data. The maps themselves create a conversation between implementers and the people who are viewing them. The second thing I wanted to show you is a more social version, which is uh, a version, a product called Twitter Vision uh, that was built by an engineer named Dave Troy. It, this product uh, started in 2007. It was exhibited in MoMA in 2008. Uh, I was part of the founding team at Twitter, and this product uh, is one of the ways in which we understood the growth of this 
of the growth of this product. Prior to the growth of Twitter, prior to this product existing, the only way we understood how many tweets there were were by looking at a public, a public live stream of all the tweets that were being created. That used to be the homepage of Twitter.com. With this product, we suddenly understood that Twitter was really a conversation that the world was having with itself, was having with different parts of, of, the, of the world, and that you could see people in different continents engaging with each other. You could see how distributed a viewpoint that Twitter provided, and that the internet itself was really this way in which the world was sharing what was going on and what was happening in one part of the world could be seen through a viewpoint in another part of the world. So this, this lens into what was happening on Twitter was absolutely absolutely critical to the founding team's understanding of what was actually being built, of how the product that they were creating actually was, ch how, how, how was actually changing the way that conversation was happening in a public way. That leads us to the final map I wanted to show you, which is uh, this week we launched uh, the president's Twitter account, and we'll skip forward in a second. Um, but the but at POTUS uh, is the first account that's in the president's voice. And within uh, within the first uh, within the first four and a half hours, he had achieved a million followers, and with uh, and now has something like 2.2 million. And this first tweet was retweeted some 300,000 times, which is you know pretty good. Um, but all those stats are kind of stale. They, kind of, they don't really tell a story. You don't know what 300,000 looks like. You don't know what it means. But if you skip forward through the first few minutes of what this account looks like and the number of mentions that are happening of at POTUS, you immediately start to see the map light up and you understand that this is a conversation and this is an engagement that the world is having with uh, the account of the President of the United States and the, the perspective that he is sharing. The point of having an account like this is to be able to share uh, the president's viewpoint on America and his lens on how he sees the world. And the at POTUS account, the map, is what allows you to see that we're really connecting with the whole world and sharing that viewpoint with everyone. So again, all of the work that you're doing here allows us to have this greater context. When we talk about creating uh, products in the Office of Digital Strategy, one of the things we talk about is creating more surface area for engagement. You know, oftentimes in government, people ask you, uh, if you're the social media purpose, person, what can you do to make content go viral online? We need something that will really pop, like an ice bucket challenge or something like that. There's no way to predict, there's no way to kind of go in a priori and create an ice bucket challenge, but what you can do is create more surface area for engagement, and what you guys are doing uh, with maps and with the open data that uh, the government's providing to create more and more interesting maps is literally increasing the surface area for that engagement. Um, so thank you so much for all your hard work, and I'm excited uh, that you're all here today. Thanks, Jason. Fantastic. Next up is GOTUS, the geographer of the United States, Lee Schwartz, who joins us from the State Department. Thank you. Uh, I clearly didn't have enough uh, coffee this morning to match the energy in this room, but um, I'm, I'm very excited about, about this effort, and I thank uh, Corey and, and uh, the White House, OSTP, for hosting it. And, and most of all, I want to I want to also congratulate the Presidential Innovation Fellows uh, for all the great work they've been doing uh, for the past couple of years and, and, and this year in particular. I'm familiar with this uh, with with many in this class of fellows, and they're and they're doing tremendous work in the areas of open data and, and crowdsourcing. It's also nice to see uh, so many familiar faces around this room who have been working on these initiatives from a, a whole host of government agencies, academia, elsewhere. Uh, there's a lot of energy here, and I hope, I hope we can uh, extend that outward. Uh, I, I may uh, be GOTIS, but I, I want to tell you I, I, I saw the National Geography Bee uh, recently. It's, I, I used to um, be a judge at the National Geography Bee where I had all the answers ahead of time and considered myself pretty sharp. And uh, unfortunately, my wife had recorded it, and we showed it at, at our house when some of our neighbors were over, and I actually had to try to answer the questions, and I clearly am not as smart as a 12-year-old, um, so uh, kids were pretty impressive. Um, I love maps. Uh, I think that's probably clear, and, I, and I'm rather biased, but I also believe that even given the rapid change and advancements in technology, that maps remain by far the best vehicle to merge and present the results of open data and crowdsourcing initiatives. And in, in my work at the State Department, uh, I deal with maps all, all the time, and let me tell you, in this world of big data, what matters most to me are good data. And so I think that's uh, something we all need to keep in mind as we, as, a, as we do our mapathons. 
Uh, one thing that hasn't changed about maps, despite technological advances, is maps are hard work. Uh, they, they've always been hard work uh, into making a good map. That's been true since the days of exploration. And they were always a collaborative effort. Uh, maps were built, they were iterative over time. And, and uh, that, took, that, that dominated mapping for, for centuries until actually the most recent um, couple of decades when the use of satellite imagery and, and overhead platforms actually took the world of, uh, of exploration into, into the world of science. And we had a lot of mapping done remotely and actually with tremendous um, results to create maps, develop models, create new data, and better understand both the physical and human world. But I think in recent years, we've, we've seen, a, seen a swing back, I think, back to the people. Uh, the collaborative culture of our, of our cartographic forefathers, I think, now is resurfacing in the world of the internet and data availability and, and crowdsourcing and various different platforms, such as OpenStreetMaps, also leading to tremendously successful results. Just in the past, past two weeks, for example, the amount of work that's been done uh, related to the uh, Nepal earthquake has been remarkable. We've seen uh, more data being created, more maps being created uh, quicker and at, at much greater scale, involving thousands of people than we've, than we've uh, ever seen in similar events in the past. Uh, so a lot, of, uh, a lot of volunteer mappers remotely in collaboration with our colleagues uh, in, in the field in Nepal have really made this, I think, at least from a mapping perspective, a uh, success story. Uh, of course, it's unfortunate that it takes events like uh, Ebola and Haiti and the earthquake in Nepal to uh, galvanize this network. And I think part of our responsibility here is to how, how at the State Department, we like to say, building volunteer diplomatbers, diplomappers, to, um, to do this on a more regular basis, to, get a, to realize the power of, of crowdsourced information, volunteer geographic information, and the understanding it gives of our own uh, explanation of, of where we live uh, so, because there's no more authoritative data than the data that are provided by the, the people themselves who live in various communities. It's also, in a way, uh, in the tools we have, authoritative data because it's a type of information that you can verify because it's actually a feature on an image. And so I think that's important that this is, this is data that's generated by people, it's owned by the people, it empowers communities, uh, it's got a certain amount of authority, uh, it can be verified. Uh, and at the end of the day, it allows us to better explain our, our societies. Uh, people have heard me talk before, uh, have heard me talk about how we need to build a satellite to collect information about human geography. Our, our uh, satellites that are collecting digital elevation models, uh, model data, and other terrain type of information uh, are, are financed by, by uh, billions of dollars of uh, government taxpayer money. And I think we can, do, we can do the same thing with a lot of the features on the ground in a ground up approach uh, at, at, a, at, a, at a much uh, lower cost and, and much, uh, much higher efficiency if we can just galvanate uh, the kind of energy, energy we see in this room today. Finally, I want to say that this is especially a good, uh, the mapathon we're about to go and the tools we're about to see displayed are great tools for, for young people. And if we can involve young people and universities and educators in, in open mapping, it's really a, 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 a very, uh, it's a zero, zero barrier entryway for people to get involved in the world of, of mapping. And so uh, I'm excited about the possibilities there as well. Uh, you're, gonna be some, you're gonna see some wonderful examples of some initiatives today on open mapping. Uh, and I, I look forward to the, uh, to the participation in it and also the results. And finally, I wanna say that uh, above all, mapathons are supposed to be fun, all right? There, you, you can really enjoy doing this. Uh, a lot of times I, I struggle with the idea of how we incentivize volunteerism. Like I said, when it's a disaster, it's easy, but how do we incentivize it uh, on a regular basis? You know, pizza and beer uh, sometimes work, but I think getting communities of like-minded people together uh, and, getting the sp uh, and galvanizing the tremendous spirit of volunteerism we have in this country and around the world is one way to not only uh, produce good results from open mapping, but really to, uh, to enjoy yourself. So most of all, have fun today, uh, enjoy it, and good luck. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, Godis. That was a wonderful um, introduction. And it's my, uh, my pleasure. I'm Denise Ross. I'm the Presidential Innovation Fellow working on the power outage mapping today. And um, we're going to dive right into 
three lightning talks about the direct impact that your work today will have on the real world. And I'd like to start with Benson Wilder. He's a geographer with the U.S. State Department's Humanitarian, Humanitarian Information Unit. Thanks. Thanks very much. Thanks for having us. Uh, so I want to talk a bit about MapGiv, uh, which uh, some of you will be taking part in some of our projects today. MapGiv is a program of the U.S. State Department. Our, our goal is linking uh, data diplomacy and collaborative mapping, uh, and specifically linking volunteers around the world uh, with communities on the ground, because we believe, as the State Department, uh, in advancing our foreign po policy goals, that um, shared understanding can be achieved not only through maps, but also by the process of mapping together. Next slide. So MapGive is a lot of things. Uh, we deal with imagery. Uh, we have a process we developed in consultation and collaboration with the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, leveraging the NextView license. Uh, we do a lot of events domestically and, and around the world uh, in terms of public engagement and public diplomacy. Uh, we're engaged in the technology side, working with a broad range of partners in government and outside of government on how to improve the tools and better understand OpenStreetMap and better utilize it. Um, and we try to work through our various networks um, and, those, and those partnerships uh, to use the reach of this department um, to uh, expand uh, the, the goal of OpenStreetMap, which is to build the best map of the world that is open and free and editable. Next slide. I mentioned a lot of our partners. Uh, we have a lot of partnerships internal to the department and with USAID. Uh, we work through the Bureau of Information, International Information Programs and Educational and Cultural Affairs um, to link in with the work that they are doing in a number of exchanges. But these are just a few of our external institutional partners. And I think everyone who's here already knows that OpenStreetMap has really had a coming out party in the last couple of years, not just in the, vein, in the realm of humanitarian response, but we're really happy to be working collaboratively, not just on the map, but on, on the larger project. Uh, so, yes, OpenStreetMap is useful for crisis response. Uh, we have tried to fill gaps when, when they exist uh, through the provision of satellite imagery services. Uh, we supported the Typhoon Haiyan response as well as Typhoon Hagapit. Uh, with Haiyan, we did a pretty good job. We got services out very soon after the, after the um, typhoon hit landfall. With Hagapit, even though it ended up thankfully being a smaller event, we had services supporting mapping before the, the storm even hit landfall. But it's notable that just a year later, and you can see the southern path is Haiyan, the northern is Hagapit, there was still a lot of mapping to do with the Philippines, even though everybody knew that another storm or storms were inevitable. And there's still a lot of work to be done. Next slide. So OpenStreetMap is very useful in the field. And of course, a lot of what we're doing is driven by humanitarian requirements from partners like the American Red Cross, who are using the data in, in real time on, on handhelds and in paper form. Next slide. Uh, but also in context like Ebola, a more long, slower moving crisis, which still hasn't ended. And uh, we supported uh, some mapping there as well. But in Liberia, a lot of the work is ongoing and is focused on supporting community health workers, uh, both with health organizations and the, working with the national government to build longer term capacity. The data that's being produced, um, and this is a big goal of MapGiv, is, is, is um, utilizing geographic data throughout the cycle from emergency relief to recovery, uh, to longer term development, and as part of that, um, disaster mitigation and, and reducing the risks of crises before they hit. Next slide. Uh, we did a lot of mapathons in the context of Ebola, some of them with the American Red Cross. We also uh, accomplished, uh, it was the first case where we accomplished our goal of having one of our foreign posts ho host a mapathon. The uh, consulate in Jerusalem sponsored a mapathon in Ramallah in the West Bank. Uh, and a number of, of students um, and youth there uh, learned how to map and contributed to the map in the Ebola-affected region half a world away. And that's the sort of thing we're trying to, trying to grow and multiply. Next slide. But I want to come back to Nepal, not just because of the recent response, but because it has been a crucible for a lot of the partnerships and the approaches that we're going to be talking about today. Uh, the importance of data preparedness, of mapping before a crisis hits, um, the usefulness of data uh, in longer term efforts and ur basic urban planning. So uh, one of our first partnerships uh, was with our colleagues at USAID, the World Bank's Global Facility for Z Disaster Reduction and Recovery, um, George Washington University, who with USAID helped mobilize their students to actually do the mapping. And they mapped, um, and, and of course, humanitarian open street map team, who will get no shortage of, of credit and plaudits today. Um, so a lot of Kathmandu was mapped pretty well uh, before the earthquake hit. 
particularly the health facilities and the schools. And that was as part of a specific disaster reduction, disaster mitigation program. And the local focal point, as Megan mentioned, was Kathmandu Living Labs, led by Dr. <laughs> Dr. Nama Budutoki, uh, who is um, there now. Um, we actually had tried to sponsor him to come for the Humanitarian Open Street Map Team Summit um, and weren't able to do that in time. And luckily, he was there to, when the earthquake struck and has been leading the response even now. Next slide. Uh, so we will talk a lot about the response, and we'll be doing mapping in Nepal later. Uh, but even though Kathmandu is well mapped, there's a lot of work to be done outside. Next slide. And uh, KLL was working both uh, inside their situation room and then outside as the aftershocks continue to hit. And the importance of these local focal points are a big goal of MapGive. Growing, linking OpenStreetMap communities uh, through our embassies and consulates and missions where, um, when they do exist, and growing communities when they don't exist. Next slide. Next slide. Uh, so there are many different kinds of data, many different uses. Next slide. Uh, and many, many partners who are using them. Uh, and we're, of course, the scale, the speed of data creation is impressive. Um, and Megan had mentioned 2,000 volunteers in 48 hours. We're now at over 5,000. But that's only 5,000. It's a big world. The world keeps changing. There's always more mapping to be doing. Next slide. Next. And a lot of what we're trying to do is get the word out, improve the tools for learning in collaboration with others. Next slide. Uh, our Italian colleagues have already translated the MapGive education tools into Italian. French and Spanish are coming. We'd love to do more. Everything is in the commons. Next. And we look forward to mapping with everybody today. Thank you. Thank you, Benson. Next up is Chris Gorenson. He's a Presidential Innovation Fellow with the U.S. Department of Interior, and he will be talking about Every Kid in a Park and My America. <laughs> Thanks, Denise. Uh, well, I'm super excited to be here. Uh, as, as Denise mentioned, I'm Chris Gorenson. I'm, I'm working with a really incredible team there in the back, uh, Jerry Johnston, uh, Gary Latsky, and Edgar Pedroza on this uh, really awesome project today, uh, Every Kid in a Park. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, Ta-da. Um, so this is a really exciting initiative. Um, you know, just some, some, bas uh, some basic uh, information that, that's helpful to kind of put this in context about why this is so important. Um, we know uh, through a Kaiser Family Foundation study in 2010 that uh, on average, uh, young people spend about seven hours per day on electronic media use, um, which basically equates to a full-time job, right? 80% um, of families live in urban areas, that's actually over 80%, um, so there's a real disconnect sometimes between nature and, and where people grow up and live. Uh, and one of the big goals of the program is to really get um, you know, up to a million fourth grade uh, children um, from low-income areas into, into national parks. And I should say, these aren't just the national parks you're familiar with, but these are also Bureau of Land Management areas, um, Bureau of uh, Reclamation areas, um, Army Corps of Engineers sites, um, and so on and so forth. So, so part, of the, part of the goal here with the data is really to identify some of these opportunities around urban areas that people generally might not be aware of and figure out ways to connect them. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so, you know, just to kind of state the, the, the context of what we're doing here. Um, you know, the, the really, the, the goal here is that no matter who you are, or where you live, every kid should be able to enjoy America's parks, monuments, lands, and waters, right? And, and really part of what we want to establish here is sort of the next generation of, of conservation stewards for the parks and, and really get people excited and engaged. And we know that if we get them engaged young, that they'll be really excited about how to carry these things forward. Um, next slide, please. Um, so big goals for the project are, are as such. Um, we certainly want to make it easy for schools and families to plan trips. Um, and part of what we do today will do that. Um, so we need your help and engagement to figure out how to use our data sets to improve the information, how to share information about educational activities, uh, and, and really connect uh, individuals with the, the nature around them. Um, part of the program will also provide transportation support with schools um, and certainly those communities that have the most need. So there's a real need to route these communities to parks around them and to really get them excited and engaged. Uh, and then, of course, providing educational materials, but the, the bottom line really is getting kids outside and really connected to nature, right? All right, next slide, please. Um, yes, uh, so, so Lee Schwartz uh, mentioned, uh, I, I think with the spelling bee reference, that um, I think being around really smart kids makes you feel kind of dumb. Um, this actually made me feel like I wasn't really sure why I had a job. Um, this was a design session that we had um, with Center City uh, Public Charter School here in DC. 
and through the University of Maryland's kids team. Um, so this is me uh, during the presentation, that's Secretary Jewell. Um, I pretty much didn't say anything. Um, the kids did all the talking. This is one of their early prototypes for an interactive activity on the website. Um, it, really, the baseline here is that, that you know, we know that engaging kids is really critical. Um, so the data is certainly part of this, but we need to figure out ways to actually make this exciting and, and I think liberating and, and also challenging for kids. So I think any ideas that, that you know, our team can get out of you towards that is also, I think, a secondary goal um, of what we hope to do today. Um, next slide, please. Um, oh, and there's the goal. Uh, improve accuracy and attributes for the EKIP educational activities data set. Um, next slide. Um, so in the data set, there is a column, and we'll get more into this in the workflow, but there's specific sites and resources and activities um, that really dive into things that kids can do there. So these would be locations of aquariums, these are places they can take tours, you know, so on and so forth. So, um, you know, please help us uh, figure out how to tie these back. If we can go to the next slide, please. Um, in OpenStreetMap right now, sometimes this is all you get. This is just a point. So we need help to identify features and roads and paths. Uh, we're going to be working with the wonderful folks behind NP Map that do the um, really cool crowdsourced uh, uh, trails mapping. Um, so, you know, I, I think it's a really fantastic opportunity to think about how maps can, can really make this just a, a really fun project to work on. Next slide. Uh, and finally, key features, um, in addition to facilities and all the stuff you think about, we want to capture some things that maybe we don't think about that might be really important. Things like handicap accessibility, restrooms, um, that's really important to kids, by the way. Makes sense. Uh, educational activities and, and, of course, all the recreational activities that we enjoy. Um, next slide. And this is our team. So we're back in the back uh, table. Please um, join us and help us make some really awesome stuff for kids. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. Um, the next, next slide set is mine, and I'm going to talk about the Power Outage um, Data Creation Project. So today what we're going to be doing is creating data about sources of information on power outages. Living in New Orleans until recently, power outages have been a recurring theme of my life for about the last decade. I was without power for six months during, after, during and after Katrina, so I know what it's like to try to make a plan to keep your family safe and less miserable during and after severe weather events. In my role at the, with the Department of Energy, I've spoken with many other potential users of power outage information. People like a volunteer firefighter in New York State who wants to be able to use his mobile phone to look up and notify the correct power company when he encounters a downed power line in the field. Or the mobile app developers with the Red Cross and the Weather Channel who want to give their users an easy lookup tool for information about outages wherever they may be. I've also seen emergency managers within government maintain personal lists of their power company contacts to call on when they need to wrangle up counts of households without power across multiple service areas. Next slide. The challenge here is not trivial. There are more than 3,000 power company service areas in the United States, and there's no centralized directory that will point you to the information that each of these companies releases about their power outages. Next slide. Some companies have 1-800 numbers, Facebook pages, Twitter feeds, and online interactive maps where you can visualize the scope and the estimated restore time for the power outages. Next slide. Other companies communicate about their outages by way of an 800 number and a very active Twitter feed. Next slide. Today we will be using OpenEI, which is a free and open knowledge sharing platform created by Department of Energy at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory in 2009 as part of the White House Open Government Initiative. OpenEI has been crowdsourcing energy information and providing it in an international standard and machine readable formats since way before this was cool. We'll be adding five attributes to each power company in the United States. The data will then be available via an open API so that anyone, such as the Red Cross, for example, can tap into it to get the latest power outage information sources. Next slide. But this task is huge. With more than 3,000 power companies in the US and collecting five pieces of data about each one, you're talking about more than 15,000 unique pieces of data. That's why we're using this Mapathon to kick off our summer of data creation. So I want to introduce our summer interns, Jeremy Call and Henry Pup. Can you guys come up? Um, Je Jeremy spent eight years, Jeremy right here, um, on active duty with the Coast Guard driving small boats for search and rescue and drug and migrant interdictions. 
Henry spent six years on active duty with the Navy, making sure critical electrical systems were mission ready on his 90,000 ton aircraft carrier. They're both in the midst of career pivots, applying their GI Bill to geography degrees at George Mason University. We've brought them in at the Department of Energy for the summer to work on this high value data set. For those of you on site at this mapathon, my challenge for you today is let's fill in this map for Jeremy and Henry with as many records as we can so they can focus this summer on honing their tech skills and making this data come alive for citizens, first responders, disaster volunteers, and emergency managers. My challenge to the audience today on live stream and here in person is to think about how you might use open mapping as a way to one, create high value open geospatial data, and two, to bring together diverse volunteers at different stages in their careers and different technical skill levels as an opportunity to recruit more youth into STEM and veterans into tech to do great things to make the world a better place. Thanks, guys. Thank and next up, um, I'm going to introduce Courtney. who will talk about our international connections today. Hello, my name is Courtney Clark, and I work at the Peace Corps. Um, and we're so excited about the remote mapping parties that are also going on um, around the country and even around the world today. So currently, Peace Corps staff have gathered, and they're mapping right now at our headquarters. Um, the sixth grade geography class at the School Without Walls at Francis Stevens Middle School right here in DC is having their own mapping party. So I'd like to give a quick shout out to their teacher, Cicely Ogunchakin, who's here in the room. Um, she's been, <laughs> she's really been an invaluable practitioner of open street map within her classroom and is a model for, for teachers around the country. Um, and finally, the National Park Service in Denver, they're also remote mapping for the Every Kid in a Park project. Um, and I also wanted to talk about mapping in Botswana. So this past Monday, 20 Peace Corps staff um, and, bot and volunteers in Botswana hosted our first overseas mapathon. Um, so this photo shows some Peace Corps volunteers. We have uh, Teresa, um, Peggy, and Christy, our country director, Tim Hartman, and then former president of Botswana, Festus Mohai. So they met with former president Mohai to talk about uh, Peace Corps' efforts to create detailed maps of their sites within Botswana and of the entire country. Um, and they're also remote mapping in Botswana today. So thank you so much. And thank you to all the remote mappers um, on the live stream. <laughs> next up. And, and next we have Mikhail Marin, uh, Presidential Innovation Fellow. Uh, thanks a lot, Courtney. Um, thank you for running the slides. That's a great help. Um, we are about to close out the live stream. So just to our, our audience out there, thank you very much for tuning in. Um, please don't stop mapping. Um, if you want to continue, uh, next slide. Yes, you are now invited to map. Map now, map in the future, hold a mapping event yourself. Uh, a great way to get started is mapgive.state.gov. Next slide. And uh, share your ideas, your experiences. If you have ideas for, for new mapping projects, uh, WH Mapathon is the hashtag. So thanks very much for tuning in, and goodbye. <laughs>